Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I feel really honoured and a bit anxious that it should be my privilege to give the fifth and last of this series of lectures associated with our World Peace Exposition over the road. I've called this lecture, What Buddhism Can Contribute to Britain and to World Peace? And I hope you'll find it a little bit interesting. Uh, in our World Peace Exposition, there is an ingenious device representing the law of cause and effect. The law which explains what is termed uh, in the East as karma and in the West as destiny. For those of you who have not yet seen it, it consists of a golden ball, sort of golden, which rolls down a complicated network of channels triggering off a number of happenings en route. So the ball, of course, represents the cause, and the happenings are the effects arising from the cause. Spotlit above it is a quotation from the Lotus Sutra, taught by Gautama, or Shakyamuni Buddha as he's known, more than 3,000 years ago, and used again by the Buddha of this age, Nichiren Daishonin, 700 years ago, to illustrate this most fundamental law of life. The quotation reads as follows. Likewise, the Shinjikan Sutra states, if you want to understand the causes that existed in the past, look at the results as they are manifested in the present. And if you want to understand what results will be manifested in the future, look at the causes that exist in the present. This law of causality is in fact the renge of the phrase that we chant, nam yo ho renge kyo. Renge means the lotus flower, which reveals its flower and its seeds simultaneously. In other words, the effect is created simultaneously by the cause and becomes lodged immediately deep in our lives, ready to be drawn up to the surface the moment the time and the circumstances are right. It's an incredible thought, isn't it? That every single moment of each day we are making causes which at once reap effects that are lodged in our lives and must inevitably appear at some appropriate moment. And of course, in their manifestation, these effects in their turn trigger off more causes. So this is how we shape our destiny, create and recreate the eternal chain of our karma. This is why the Buddha said those words to the effect that if you want to know what your past was like, just look at what is happening to you now. Likewise, if you wish to know your future, look at the causes you are making today and tomorrow and onwards into the future. Once we've grasped this and really understand it, we can see that any attachments we may have had to fortune tellers or palmists, reading the stars every day in the evening standard, or getting all worked up about some peculiar dream the night before is just a waste of time. The deed is done, isn't it? And cannot be undone. However, at this point of human realization, Buddhism then shines a brilliant light of hope because it teaches that we, what we can do is to change the unhappy aspects of our destiny by striving our utmost to establish and maintain a chain of great causes which will overcome and lighten the misfortune we may have created for ourselves through bad causes in the past. 
In one of the many writings which Nietzsche and Daishonin left to guide us, he said in a letter to one of his followers, who was a samurai and who had survived an ambush and a fearful sword fight, the following words. When one comes to the end of his good fortune, no strategy whatsoever will avail. When one's blessings are exhausted, even his retainers will no longer follow him. You survived because you still possess good fortune. In other words, everyone is born with a measure of good fortune and a measure of misfortune. This, if you like, is the balance sheet of our cause and effect ledger at the end of our previous life, which is then carried forward to the next life. What more logical statement can one think of, really, to account for the inequalities we see amongst people at birth? Some born with a silver spoon in their mouths, others born sickly, some with cruel and some with kind parents and so on. We are reaping, Buddhism says, what we have deserved. The effects of the causes that we have made in the past of our eternal lives. Speaking for myself, I had a very fortunate childhood and a very fortunate youth in many, many respects. I had wonderful parents and a very secure and protected upbringing. As a young man, too, somehow, I always seemed to be in the right place at the right time to advance my life. But by the time I was in my mid-thirties, I began to realize that things were changing in a very subtle and insidious way. Somehow, I wasn't in the right pl place at the right time anymore. Somehow, what I said no longer seemed to carry the weight that it had carried before. I had, from the very beginning of my adult life, suffered from difficulties in other areas, in marriage and in financial matters. But now, at that moment in my life, even the areas in which my life had shone previously seemed to be fading and growing stagnant. I know now, of course, that my natural good fortune, the good fortune that I was born with, was running out. It was a very bewildering and distressing time for me. Somehow, I knew my life was sinking into mediocrity, though I'm sure to others, probably on the surface, it may have appeared the same. It was to be 10 more year, years and, and a bit more after that, before I found Buddhism and realized the reasons for this state of affairs, as explained by the Buddha, and set out to generate sufficient power in my life through practicing, as Nichiren Daishonin taught, in order to change my destiny and build good fortune once again. So I've talked at length about karma or destiny because for the purposes of what I want to say tonight, it's important to understand that just as I have my own individual destiny or karma, it is this karma of mine, together with your personal karma, and the karma, for example, of everyone walking down Kensington High Street at this moment, and the karma of each of millions of people in Britain who may be watching the telly tonight, or having a meal at this moment, which forms the karma or destiny of our people. That is to say, the karma of Britain. What do we see as the karma of our country? What is the good fortune that our people have and what is their misfortune? This could be the subject of a whole lecture in itself. But tonight, I just want to dwell on one aspect of this national karma. It certainly comes under the heading of misfortune and it is widespread in its present manifestation. I refer 
to apathy. Apathy is like, I think, a dense fog. It creeps up insidiously, unnoticed, and can infiltrate to every corner of our minds. It's the world, isn't it, of, oh, let them get on with it. What can I do about it anyway? Or the world of, I'm all right, Jack. The world of, can't you leave me alone? Of course, there are marvelous exceptions in this country. But taking our people as a whole, can we deny that apathy is rife? And apathy is not confined only to those who want to keep to their own backyards and avoid looking over the fence at the problems in the world beyond. It exists wherever we look, in public life as well. There are those in power, for example, who occupy their minds and, as protection, make sure that the minds of others are sidetracked with comparatively minor matters instead of using their energies to challenge the major problems of today, challenges which require courage and tenacity and the will to sustain the struggle and to win. At this point, I'd like to make it clear that in saying this, I'm not criticizing any one individual or any class or category of individual. And I'm certainly not that saying that everyone is acting intentionally in this way. Apathy is a creeping sickness that takes people unawares. In Buddhist terms, it is the weapon of the negative and destructive force of life, which like its opposite, the energy of creation, is inherently within every single one of us. Nichiren Daishonin described apathy in a delightful little story which, once heard, is quite difficult to forget. So I'm going to read it to you. Deep in the snow mountains lives a bird called Kankucho, which, tortured by the numbing cold, cries that it will build a nest in the morning. Yet, when the day breaks, it sleeps away the hours in the warm light of the morning sun without building its nest. So it continues to cry vainly throughout its life. The same is true of people. I think at times we're all Kankucho birds. Buddhism, which points out that all life in the entire boundless universe is compounded of the tug and pull of opposing forces, positive and negative, value against anti-value, construction against destruction, then offers the solution, a practice which generates the power of the Buddha state, the highest state of human life, which inherently exists, yet lies latent in every single one of us. Speaking personally, I know of no other power strong enough and available, what is more, in such inexhaustible supplies that it can actually sustain a life of creation and construction 365 days of every year. When I first contemplated practicing Nichiren Daishonin's Buddhism, I was a businessman. And I remember asking a Japanese man who had practiced many years how I could possibly find the time in my busy, and of course what I meant was important life, to practice twice daily morning and evening. Ah, he said, you're forgetting, Mr. Corston, that the practice activates wisdom and life force. So don't worry, you'll get twice as much done in your day in addition to the practice. And of course he proved to be absolutely right, as many members here would understand. Later I committed another Buddhist howler by rushing home to my wife one day and saying, this practice is really incredible. The people I had to negotiate with today are usually so obstinate and difficult, but today everything went so fantastically smoothly. They've really changed. And it didn't take my wife very long to wag a finger at me. She'd practiced longer than I had and say, it's not them that's changed, it's you. <laughs> I'm neither 
uh, a historian nor an academic in any sense. But it's my summing up of the history of our people to conclude that whilst the tendency to be apathetic has of course always is existed in each one of us as it does in every human being, apathy did not become wholly apparent as a national tendency until after the Second World War. Sad to say, it then became so obvious as to become labelled in some parts of the world as the British sickness. So why should this be so? Why should this national apathy suddenly appear? I think it's worth examining just for a moment. Up to the end of the 18th century, like other nations of the West, we had been fighting for our very existence, for a place in this world. We wished, like other races and nations, to establish ourselves indestructibly. Our way of life, our religion, our form of government, our sense of justice and freedom and so on. There was no time for apathy. Often we had our backs to the wall. Then, in the age of colonialism, we sprinted off the mark to extend our trade and influence, to protect our way of life by imposing it to a lesser or a greater degree on subject peoples. We were mostly very successful. Great chunks of the world became subject to Britain, magnifying our pride and our belief in our heritage. We were, I believe in those times, in a sense thinking of ourselves as the chosen people. And God was definitely on our side. Again, there was no time for apathy. But at home, the seeds of this disease were just beginning to be sown in the circumstances surrounding the development of industry. The Industrial Revolution, as it's termed, to cope with our huge and expanding markets. So as the industrialists drove forward, ever expanding, ever inventing, innovating, and expanding again, our people flooded from the countryside into the cities, and instead of finding their fortune as they hoped, sank into the morass of cheap labor, poverty, and appalling living conditions. In such fearful surroundings, trapped as they were, by the industrial environment of those times, victims began to fall to the germs of the disease of apathy, and in inevitably those so afflicted were the poor. Nevertheless, the great empire on which it was said the sun never set still thrived, and with it the hopes and dreams of the British people. In terms of history, it was not to be so very long before these dreams were shattered. In World War I, we lost virtually an entire generation in the mud and misery of Flanders. We won the war with the help of our allies, but what had we gained? This was the question on everyone's lips. I was born in 1920, just after World War I ended. By the time I was four or five, the war was still a constant topic of conversation. My favorite reading when I had measles was the illustrated news of the war in ten huge great volumes that lasted me all day with their pictures. People were still stunned by the loss of their loved ones, and many bereaved parents in those days still dressed in black. Even though I was so young, I remember very vividly this atmosphere of mourning. People were totally confused. For many, including my parents, their belief in a loving and all-merciful God was either wholly or partially shattered. Hadn't the Germans, they said, thought that God was on their side as well? The aftermath of World War I saw the beginning of the spread of apathy not just amongst the poor and the deprived, but amongst people of all classes. For some of my parents' generation who had survived World War I, the fearful depression 
which followed in the 30s, and the rise of Hitler, bringing the ghastly possibility of another war over the horizon, was the final straw. Some became seriously neurotic and depressed and often alcoholic. Nevertheless, most people rallied to the flag once again, and it took the slaughter of another world war, combined with the disintegration of our empire, to provide the devilish force of apathy with the means to deliver what one might term its coup de grace. This came in the early 50s, when we woke up from the dreams of another great victory, and our return, as we thought, to the sort of lives we had led in pre-war years, to find our country stripped of most of its power. With our empire gone and supreme power in other hands, I believe from that point we totally lost direction as a nation and a people, and we have been floundering ever since. In those post-war years, I think it would be fair to say that youth, more than anyone else, sensing the malaise of the times, tried to find a way through the fog of apathy that had, that had enveloped everybody. Many of us may have been critical or deeply concerned about the drug scene, Ted's and punks, the plethora of gurus, the flower children and so on. But at least they were trying to seek for something. Sadly, they didn't find it. And today we see the outlet for this frustration in, I believe, increasing violence. I think you'll agree with me that in the past, when there were riots, they were usually for some sort of cause. But I understand that the exact reasons for the outbreak of the Toxteth rioting in Liverpool, for example, are virtually impossible to clearly define. These young people lashed out at everything and anything. Though they may not have been able to voice their reasons for acting in the way they did, and I understand many find it difficult to do so, might it not have been subconsciously their utter frustration at the total lack of direction and purpose which they feel envelops them and everybody else in this country like a dense fog? To the background of unemployment and the constant hidden fear that there could be a nuclear war before long, in which case everything's a waste of time anyway. So I think I've talked quite enough now about the disease, and we really must start to consider the cure. In doing so, I want to take you back once again into history, this time only a little way back to the beginning of World War II, when the German panzer divisions had overrun large chunks of France and the British army had their backs to the sea on the beaches at Dunkirk. How easy it would have been for us to surrender then and for our people, ill-armed and poorly equipped as we were, to have sunk into a sea of apathy just waiting for the Germans to invade. That this did not happen was due Firstly, of course, to the incredible determination of our people to defend their freedom at all costs. And secondly, I believe to the fact that both the enemy, the nature of the enemy, and, the, and uh, the boundaries of the disastrous situation that was occurring was definable. I mean by that the obstacle to the Germans of the English Channel our ability to mislead the Germans as to our strength and intentions and the fighting spirit of the people. Of course it was a gamble, but the options were clear. Today, we're in a very different situation. In the context of a possible nuclear holocaust, the boundaries of our situation, if they exist at all, are beyond our imagination altogether. An increasing number of people in our country are beginning to cry out for peace. But inevitably, their cry 
is a choking and emotional one, bereft of sound solutions, because they see the immensity of the problem and our lack of power as a nation to really do anything concrete about it. Indeed, they probably only have to watch the antics of the superpowers to see that the old power bases of military and now nuclear might are in fact an anachronism, an anachronism. In their hearts more and more, people are, I believe, yearning to find a new power basis with which to establish peace. And it is the lack of any sign of it which holds the majority in this state of helpless apathy or fearful emotion. So what ingredients must this new power basis have to overcome the distress of our people, not only of our own country, of course, but of the whole world. I believe this power must give such concrete proof of its strength and universality, its ability to overcome every human problem and every dilemma, every obstacle, both on an individual and on a collective basis, that it generates that essential ingredient of ultimate victory, which is hope. It is hope and belief in the future more than anything else which breaks through the insidious and devilish influence of apathy and enables human beings to win through in the struggle of life and change their unhappy destiny. 3,000 years ago, Shakyamuni Buddha in his wisdom and profound understanding of the law of cause and effect, which binds past, present, and future into one, predicted the chaotic age in which we now live. He called this age of intense suffering, Mapo, the latter day of the law, when the three poisons of greed, anger, and ignorance would be rife. Further, he foretold that this period would begin about 2,000 years after his death, that is to say, around 1,000 AD. Later, eight years before he died, he taught in the Lotus Sutra, not that there would be an Armageddon, not that there would be a Holocaust which would destroy the world as we know it, but that a great votary, another Buddha, would be born to transmit the universal law taught in the Lotus Sutra to the suffering people of that time. Only by abiding by this great law, he said, could the people find happiness in this most miserable of all eras in human history and achieve a new age of peace and happiness. It was Nichiren Daishonin who fulfilled Shakyamuni's predictions, and they were many and varied predictions. Nichiren Daishonin fulfilled them all exactly. And this is why he began to call himself the votary of the Lotus Sutra. As you've seen, most of you, I hope, presented in our World Peace Exposition, Nichiren Daishonin, born into 13th century J Japan, defined this great universal law as nam myo ho renge kyo and urged the people to live in harmony and rhythm with it by chanting its name to their heart's content. Then he said they would see actual proof of its power of creation and value not in some afterlife but in every aspect, both spiritual and material, of their ordinary daily lives. Furthermore, he went on to teach that a change in the heart of even one person would be the beginning of a change in society, not just in one family or one city, but in the whole world, like ripples running outwards from a pebble dropped in a pond. The concept of world peace in Nichiren Daishonin's Buddhism is essentially earthy. 
because Buddhism acknowledges the inevitable presence of the negative force as an inherent part of life. It does not envisage some utopia in which everyone in the whole wide world is chanting nam myoho renge kyo On the contrary, in this concept, there is a solid core of those who chant and generate the power to transform the negative impulses which are the cause of war and all the other evils that beset us. Whilst around them are those who see the value of their efforts and support and encourage them. Beyond those two categories, there is that inevitable group of people who couldn't care less anyway and live from day to day. In other words, world peace is not a goal in itself in accordance with Nichiren Daishonin's Buddhism. It is a milestone, a condition of life which once it is won has to be maintained. I can't help feeling and I've thought this ever since I discovered this Buddhism, that this concept of world peace, or Kosen Rufu as we call it, is most suited to the British nature. So often in our history, the few have achieved great things for the rest of us. Earlier, I talked about Dunkirk, the skippers of the little boats, and the pleasure steamers, and fishing smacks who risked their lives to evacuate our troops at Dunkirk so that they could fight another day. The courageous campaigners who achieved social reform following the Industrial Revolution. The band of dedicated people who achieved the abolition of the slave trade. Drake and his little ships against the Armada. The list is quite long. At present, NSUK is very much in the position of the few. But because of the power of our life force generated through the practice, we can give actual proof to others that no obstacle is too great to overcome. No problem is too difficult for the Buddha state, the highest state in human beings, to solve. Perhaps this World Peace Exposition, conceived and assembled by members in their spare time, is a graphic example of this. We are growing in numbers each year. Therefore, each year, there are more people providing this actual proof to others. It may seem slow, but it is sure, and it snowballs. Together with our fellow members throughout the world, we are building a great peace force of ordinary human beings who are transforming the ingredients of war which lie in the hearts of men and women into a hunger and a passion for peace. By the 21st century, I'm convinced, just as Buddhism predicts, that this will tilt the balance of this beautiful planet from its present destructive course to one which begins to be truly creative and valuable. We are not the chosen few, for our practice is available to anybody. We are not supreme. We are very, very ordinary. But we know where we are going and what we can achieve for the sake of humanity, because we have proof of the power to transform negative into positive, apathy into action, which the uni universal law of nam myoho renge kyo gives to us. We are in fact just a part of a movement of similar ordinary human beings which now spans the whole of the world, who, whether in Brazil or New York, London or Rome, Accra or Nairobi, Tokyo or Sydney are determined to win this great battle for peace. Inheritors, if you like, of a spirit which our venerable founder, Nichiren Daishonin, the Buddha of this age, expressed 700 years ago when he wrote, Only I, Nichiren, 
at first chanted nam myo ho renge kyo but then two, three and a hundred followed chanting and teaching others. Therefore, he continued, Kosen Rufu will surely be achieved as an arrow aimed at the earth cannot miss its target. Thank you very much indeed for listening. <coughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks so much. Uh, if you would like to ask any questions, uh, I'll have a real good try to answer them. About not only what I've talked about, of course, but anything that you may have seen today or anything about Buddhism. Anyone like to lead off? Don't be shy. <laughs> Did yes. Uh, for those of you who've been over the other side, uh, as you know, there's a huge painting uh, which is entirely devoted to Nam Myoho Renge Kyo, and actually on that painting uh, there are short descriptions of various aspects of that meaning. I suppose if one really set out to explain the meaning totally, uh, it would take many volumes. But I'll try to do it uh, as briefly and as reasonably as possible. Nam is a Sanskrit word which means devotion. But not devotion in a flat way, as I said it then. It means devotion of your whole self, your mind uh, and your speech and your body to Myoho Renge Kyo. So Myoho Renge Kyo, uh, Myoho, uh, is such an incredible meaning, it's difficult to say it in a few words, but Myoho, Ho, uh, ho is a law. I think better for me to say, Ho is something that can be seen. Myo is something that cannot be seen. Ho, you might say, is something manifest. Myo is something that is latent. Uh, ho uh, means all phenomena of the universe. Myo means what means what's going on behind the scenes that we can't discern. So Myo Ho represents the cycle of life. As you know, Buddhism teaches that life is eternal, life is indestructible, life is constantly passing through the cycle of Myo and Ho. I live in this world which is Ho. I die and I move into uh, what is described as Myo. A state of latency where I generate sufficient power in the entity of my life, drawing energy to me which is sufficient to take on a new physical form. And then when that energy is great enough, I appear in the world again as Ho. Sometimes I may get angry and you see my anger. That is Ho. Something else happens and I feel happy and my anger goes where? It certainly doesn't leave my life because if something else happens to make me angry, my anger appears from nowhere. So anger goes uh, into the unseen state, which is Myo. This is Myo and Ho. So everything in the whole universe is going through this cycle. Stars uh, 
scientists, I think now, are quite clearly understand that they're born by some nucleus which attracts matter. And through a whole process of amazing reactions and interactions, over billions of years, a uh, star grows. And it lives through billions and billions and billions and billions of years, and then ultimately they know it explodes. And all those little particles diffuse into the universe. When the star is there up in the sky, it's whole. When it fuses after its explosion into the universe, it's mule. 